A major investigation by the New York Times this weekend has found many of the nation's largest health insurance companies have made billions of dollars in profits by exploiting the government's Medicare. Taxpayers pay these insurance companies a set amount per beneficiary, and this amount can go up if the beneficiary is sick. Single night, there are ads trying to lure senior citizens uh, into these uh, Medicare uh, uh, programs. It's privatization. Members with a war chest of advertising money use deceptive marketing tactics to lure seniors into the wrong plans. Health insurers get more government funding for sicker patients, which has given the companies an incentive to make patients appear more ill than they actually are. They deceive seniors about how much they'll spend for out-of-pocket care. We need to protect seniors from deceptive marketing. and It is, I think, will be recognized in years to come as probably the biggest heist, the biggest fraud, the biggest uh, transfer of wealth. Nation scams involve Social Security, Medicare, and the IRS. Medicare scams are on the up which is insurance, and nothing stopping them from targeting the most vulnerable patients who may not have the resources that they need to navigate this kind of conversation. Leaving seniors with piles of unpaid medical bills. So this is why CMS has taken steps to start to crack down on deceptive marketing. This is harmful to seniors. You got to save your clients from bad decisions. You got to sell them. Selling to some people is a bad word, but selling, if you're doing it ethically, is just persuading people to make the decision that you already know is best for them. Doesn't mean forcing them into it. Doesn't mean putting a square peg into a round hole. It means finding a solution that's best for them and persuading them to make that decision. Our clients need quality service. We need to treat their problems serious because they are very real to them. They want to be heard, not dismissed. Hear them and help them. It doesn't matter if their problems seem silly to us. We want to help them. Let's get up, guys. Come on. I know a lot of you uh, puckered up when you started hearing a talk. That's okay, because you're the solution to the problem, not the government. They created the problem, and today we're going to talk about how we're solving the problem. They want to talk about how you guys are an issue, and I know you guys. Nobody's talked to more agents and brokers than me. Nobody and I know how passionate you guys are about each and every Medicare beneficiary, health insurance beneficiary that you're helping. So today, we are going to talk about how we are the solution, and we are going to change the industry for the better, and we're going to get rid of the bad actors by policing our own. You ready for it? Let's go. All right. Obviously, we're here to have a good time, but we're here to learn and we're here to grow our businesses. You know, you guys want to make more money so you can affect change, but you want to do it the right way. Who wants to do it the right way? Raise your hand. Who wants to help themselves and their family and their employees and their team by helping the end user of our services? Raise your hand. And if you're not raising your hand, what the hell are you here for? Get out. Okay? Because that means you're the problem. Today, we're going to find out about knowing what is possible. Okay? And while there's some speakers we'll have today that will stand here like this, I'll pace awkwardly because that's just who I am. So bear with me. But we're going to talk about knowing what's possible in your business, in this industry, in life. We're going to get the right mindset, but we're going to flavor it with most practical things that you can take away and affect change. 
And you know, one of the things as I'm sitting backstage that I really wanted to get across to you guys is that you will not be gratified in success in your business. Often you'll never find success, but even those who find success without caring about the user experience, the, cons the customer, the employee, the admin, the agent, uh, that you guys are part of my customer experience. I care so much about that customer experience that the, the revenue that comes, that you see, you know, you can tell that we're making more money. You know, I've lost weight, I'm tanner. That comes with, you know, finding time for myself now. A little bit of that, uh, what do they call it? Um, Self-care that TikTok talks about a lot. They talk about it too much. Some people need to get their finances right and then they can worry about getting in shape. But, you know, you see that side and you don't realize that it came through running heads through walls. It wasn't pretty. There wasn't this grand master plan. I've spent millions of dollars and 12, 14, 16 hour days trying to figure out how to make a difference six inches in front of my face. And then about two years ago, our business hit this stride where it felt surreal, ethereal. We had a family. We're 42 staff members internally, thousands of agents that work with us around the country. More than that, that come and see us and hang out with us. And we hit this stride where it's just like, it feels like we can't lose because everybody is so committed and happy and it's amazing. But for the first eight years growing it, man, it was fun but it was not pretty. Like if you think that Justin grew a business the right way because he knew what he was doing, we were just really intensely trying to figure out how to make a, a difference and do the right thing and do the best thing and build the best long-term business. And I see these people come into this industry and grow these pop-up overnight low value proposition, bullshit bait and switch businesses that fuck everything up. And then I see them get rewarded financially for it and then I see CMS and the Senate Finance Committee come out here talk shit about the agent and brokers and blah, 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 blah. And every agent and broker that I know is working their ass off to do the right thing and help people. So these stupid pieces of shit piss me off, okay? But the thing is, we are helping people. When I sat in front of a Medicare beneficiary, I haven't for a few years, well, I've sat in front of a few, put out some fires myself. They make it to me occasionally. But when I sit in front of them, I'm looking for a solution that helps their family as much as possible, whether that's finances, whether it's their healthcare decisions. Take them seriously. For the budget that they're looking at and, and what they're facing, this stuff is extremely important. It's so important, okay? And, um, you know, we've been under attack. But I want to talk a little bit about delayed gratification before I get into this slideshow. Delayed gratification is the number one theme for me. Last year it was quality and quantity. That was my theme for MedicareCon. You know, we're, we're here with the matrix, we're trying to plug into you, that seems like the theme, but my themes internally that I want to get across last year is quality and quantity. You can have a quantity of customers, a high quantity, with a quality output. Now I know that there are plenty that don't believe that because they've built low quality businesses with high quantity or they've built high quality businesses with low quantity but the truth is you can do both it's just hard but we're going to make it easier but it's still going to be hard it's nothing worth doing you know it doesn't take some amount of effort right i can give you the exact blueprint i can tell you every single thing that i ever did i could write it down like a book every decision i made to get to where i am and then you could take it that same path and it's still gonna be hard for you. That's not gonna go away. Delayed gratification is this year's theme for me. That's my theme I wanna impart on you guys. And delayed gratification means not buying shit that you can afford today so that you can grow the business effectively to the point that those things are not just affordable but obvious, like it doesn't even matter, right? So, so as part of this delayed gratification theme, I want to make sure that you guys know that making money is not bad. If making money at scale at the top, and you're making tons of money, but it's as the result of creating immense value for a lot of people, that's okay. 
The only time money is a problem is if you're doing it not creating value for other people. Who thinks we're creating value for people here? Raise your hand. Okay, good, good. All right, and so give you a story of delayed gratification. Probably the biggest delayed gratification uh, you know, effect that I've had is when my wife and I got married, we were 19, I was 19, she was 17. I don't know if some of you guys know that. I was 19, she was 17 years old. And we went to Kay's Jewelers, give it up for Kay's, you know, yeah, Kay's Jewelers. I bought her a, I think it was a $600 band, financed it. Paid payments on a $600 band and a $150 band. This band, this is it, $150 band. We've been married for 17 years. And she's been with me through eight years in the Marine Corps, combat tours, deploying all the time while we had kids in Japan. She's been with me through all of this journey in the insurance industry. And we've flown all over the world. We've had so many good experiences. And the whole time I had this $150 band on. And look, it's like grown, I'm like, an, I was much skinnier. I, uh, I have this, this huge indention in my finger. But this delayed gratification, we went to the courthouse. My mother-in-law is here. Uh, my mother-in-law took us to the courthouse. People always ask, what did your parents say? She supported us. Uh, she took us to the courthouse and paid the $100, um, <laughs> I don't want to cry about it, but uh, the $100 fee to get us married at the courthouse, $100. Next year, 2025, Tempest and I will finally have a wedding that we will, we will do a wedding and you know, now $100,000 for a wedding ain't shit to me, right? Because we delayed that gratification. The investment of this $150 ring in those years, huge delayed gratification. That same thought process will translate to your business. It will translate to your business. If you can delay the silly little purchases and reinvest back in your business. Tomorrow, I will interview up here a guy that embodies this in the business better than I ever could. He, he continues to amaze me. His name is Matt Timmon. And um, delayed gratification like crazy, guys. I mean, you know, um, only recently gave himself what I would consider a, a, a marginal or a pay raise in, in his own business. But delaying the gratification Delay, I'm just going to say it over and over again. Just think about it, right? Quit blowing money on dumb shit when you think you've made it at $150,000, $200,000, $300,000. And we're going to work on building you out of the business so that you're not imprisoned by your business. We're in this industry where people get into it as a solopreneur, a salesperson, and they can make money as a salesperson, and they never truly build a business. And, you know, I always get up on the stage and I think that I'm going to run, I'm going to uh, finish early. Haven't even started my slideshow and I'm too far into it. So I'm going to start going and, and, and try to not just uh, rant at you guys. But the industry seems like we've been under attack. You know, I mean, shit, dude, look at this. Call recording. Everybody, everybody. 72 years old and you've helped 2,000 people with their Medicare plan with zero complaints, you gotta record all your calls. <laughs> Shit, some people should have been grandfathered in, damn. You know? <laughs> oh my God, like what the hell? You know, these blanket rules. 48 hour scope rule comes back, okay? The interpretation's a little fuzzy, um, but 48 hour scope rule comes back. TPMO lead transfers, some of you guys aren't worried as much about that, but that's a big deal for some people. I actually think that might be one that is a good change, but we'll see how it's interpreted. Unfortunately, I hope there's no lawyers in here, but lawyers find a way to screw everything up. Um, agent and broker compensation, now under fire. You know, uh, how are we getting compensated for applications? I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that they're all wrong in, in the, what they're looking at. Unfortunately, I don't think they know how to fix it, but. New York Times hit pieces, Senate Finance Committee hearings and reports where they pull all the wrong people to testify. Who watched the Senate Finance Committee hearing on, uh, on, on Medicare Advantage? I watched it and I'm like, God, you know, you guys pulled in a bunch of people to create an echo chamber to, to edify what you already believed as senators. You know, Elon Musk said, and I'm going to butcher this, I, I quote it all the time, but I need to go back and look at the way he actually wrote it. He said the number one lesson 
that he could impart on someone trying to accomplish what he's accomplished is to surround yourself with people who disagree with you so that you understand that you might not always have it figured out. You need dissenting opinions so that you can, you know, I mean, Stephen Martinez is my right hand guy, man, challenges me all the time. And people are like, oh, Stephen, you know, people tell me, Stephen really, you know, challenge, I need somebody to challenge me. He's right 10% of the time, <laughs> you know? So, you know, you need that, okay? And these senators, you know, they wouldn't make it in our world, I'll just say that, you know, I, I hate to dog them, whatever, but they, if they got a spy in here, go back and tell them. They work for me anyway, kiss my ass. Uh, this feeling can bring on many thoughts, two of which are, well, if these call centers or bad field agents weren't doing so much wrong, we wouldn't have all the need for the, the uh, additional regulation or scrutiny. The government and CMS clearly do not understand or truly care how to fix any issues. That's an important, important point, truly care. Do you believe they care or do you think it's political theater? You know, or is it, is it aimed at an agenda of Democrat versus Republican? Because on the end of this is an old lady surviving off of her shitty little social security check that the government told her would be enough all those, that, that, that lifetime. And she's sitting there in her paid off house where the roof is leaking and you're trying to help her, whether it's, whether it's saving money on a Medicare supplement or, or getting a, uh, a Medicare Advantage plan that gives her money back or whatever it is, everybody's needs are different. And they get up there and they act like everybody's needs are uh, network access and shit. Like everybody's needs are different. You don't know what their needs are. We're sitting in front of them and you're barking from, you know, DC telling me how to help the people and you don't call anybody out here. The only agent and broker representative they called is some tech private equity startup that like has never sat in front of a Medicare beneficiary himself. That's not a representation of the agents and brokers. So that pissed me off. Uh, actually the ship counselor uh, that was up there was probably the, mo the most uh, knowledgeable about it, and that was shit, so that really upsets me. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, these are two thoughts, right? But I want to show you guys a third option, a third thought process about this. Overwhelmingly, insurance agents and agency owners share a common sentiment. They aim to enrich the lives of consumers and fellow agents, whether their goals are modest or ambitious, okay? If you get into this thinking, I need to make 65, 70, 70, when I got in, some of you guys know this last year, I think I shared it, I got into the insurance industry, I was a sergeant in the Marine Corps getting out after eight years, I had two kids and a wife, two babies, and I was trying to make 60,000 a year. I, if my, my estimate, if I could make $60,000 a year, I could you know, replace what I was making in, in the military. That was what I wanted. Modest goals, but no matter what, even if they're ambitious, I met, some guys recently that are here, they may be in the room, uh, whose goal is to, to, to build a $300 million business. But even in those conversations, they're talking about doing the right thing, high quality marketing, ambitiously going after the marketplace in ways that hasn't been done before. They're talking about you know, helping and enriching the lives of the agents and employees they serve, okay? And that's important. Despite occasional bad actors, the marketplace tends to favor those with positive intentions and genuine care for others, reinforcing the rule that happiness stems from pursuing goals that benefit others. I like to write stuff. That was me writing that. The way I would explain that in layman's terms is sometimes somebody wins doing the wrong thing. But are they gratified? Are they happy? Would you be happy if you did it the way they did it? Most of the time, the marketplace rewards behavior that benefits the end user, okay? The long-term gratification of the business, the long-term business model. We all wanna make money, but do we wanna do it in a way that leaves the people in our path better than we all found them? I do. I mean, sitting on a pile of money, feeling like I hurt a bunch of people, might make me suicidal. There's a lot of rich people that have killed themselves, right? So that ain't what I want to do. And I don't think that's what any of you want to do. Am I right? Okay. While exceptions exist, the rule prevails. Personal gain through helping others brings lasting satisfaction and fulfillment, emphasizing the importance of aligning goals with benefiting others. By creating value, we build equity in our lives, often yielding returns greater than what we initially invest. 
What does this mean? Sometimes when someone makes a lot of money, you think, okay, they're helping Medicare beneficiaries. Why are they making so much money helping Medicare beneficiaries? Well, it's not me versus one person. It's me helping multiple people, and then in turn, me going and scaling that up to a, a level of helping multiple agents help multiple people, okay? Scaling our efforts can amplify the effect significantly. For instance, while aiding one Medicare beneficiary may seem like a fair trade for a modest fee, it is fair. It is fair. A, a Medicare Advantage and a Medicare Supplement Commission is more than fair. You guys are getting paid well, okay? Per, per person, you are getting paid well. In some ways, maybe even too well. I mean, I hate to say that, but I think we get paid really well. It's a great business. And if you think it's not good enough, you're lying because you're here and you know, it's, you know the juice is worth the squeeze, right? It is fair. Assisting a team and serving 1,000 beneficiaries can generate substantial revenue. In this scenario, not only do we benefit from the cumulative value created for multiple people, but we also empower and benefit our team members, resulting in a win-win-win situation for all involved. My agents are winning. My employees are winning. Everybody that works for me makes more than they've made before, ever before, as long as they stay with me about six months. Everybody that's there after about six months is making more than they've ever made before. They're helping people. The consumer is satisfied because we're doing it compliantly, which compliance, by the way, yes, you need to be compliant. However, compliance is the dotting the I's and the crossing the T's. Ethical is what you need to be, right? So ethical is what I care about. We're ethically helping them. We're leaving them better than we found them. If we can't help them, we won't hurt them. Okay, and then we get to benefit at the top by helping more people help more people, this amplified effect. Where great changes to any market happen, big winners ultimately emerge. Right now, things are changing. We don't know exactly how they're changing. I believe for the agent and broker, it's safe to say that there's a path forward that is as good or greater than ever, okay? For the FMO, there's some mild uncertainty, but what we believe is going to happen is that an interpretation and a, a continuation of similar effect of the way things are will probably prevail. We'll see. But the thing is, the marketplace is going to adapt because the need is still there. In a year where they are putting a damn stick of dynamite in Part D, they can't afford to get rid of the entire agent and broker community. It's impossible. It would be suicide politically for anybody that did that. So the path forward will prevail. The carriers meeting with, actually I know this for a fact, the biggest three you know, Medicare Advantage and Part D carriers are meeting with CMS again next week. And I'm busy either later this week or early next week. There's some clarity coming you know, on all of that stuff. But the agent and broker that's in here, if you own an agency or an agent, how many of you are, are agents writing business still? How many of you have agents that work for you? How many of you are FMOs only, no agency? Okay, so the overwhelming majority of the office, or the, this, this crowd, is probably only positively impacted anyway. Um, as some of you probably saw earlier, there are you know, solutions that come, technology innovation that will pave the way for a future no matter what happens, right? And I'm pretty cynical about any governmental change disrupting the flow of funds too much because I just don't believe that. I think the, the government is crony, so I don't think that'll happen. But I do believe that the path forward is probably going to be more prosperous for the people who understand that business as usual isn't always the path forward. The path forward may be innovating, creating new opportunities for people. So I'm gonna talk about two paths to building a business. And the first one I'm gonna talk about is top down. And I'm gonna tell you, 99% of you have not taken this path, and that's okay, but I wanna talk about it so that you can understand what you're competing against conceptually. The top down path and the bottom up path, but the top down path works like this. It requires steps that are foreign to most of you because you're not doing this. Uh, and you are doing this part, so I don't wanna say this, but it requires this. If I'm doing a top down approach, this means that I am going to create a concept and a philosophy and a path, and then I'm going to get funded through relatives or private equity or whatever, right? I'm gonna get funded, and then I'm gonna go 
I'm going to listen to my agents, I'm going to listen to consumers, I'm going to create the data, and I'm going to create the next Netflix of Medicare, right? That's just a top-down path, okay? There are some of these out here. Um, I don't want to name any names, but there's some on the FMO side that do this. There are call centers that do this. There are different types of tech platforms that are out there trying to do this. They're creating this top-down approach. And so when you see these businesses pop up overnight that are like, wow, they have all this infrastructure and all this, just remember, they're not profitable and they're taking the top-down approach, okay? So you're not competing against them, you're competing in a different way. Some people wanna to stick to revenue models they know because it is hard to teach an old dog new trick. tricks. So I put this in here because I was talking about listening to the agents. And you know, on the FMO side right now, if you have an old school FMO and you see TPMO to TPMO lead transfers under fire, FCC cracking down on more um, lead development practices, and then you see uh, the you know, administrative override marketing money conversation happening and the way they wanna kinda uh, make sure that things aren't getting unfairly, people aren't getting unfairly compensated for the actual enrollment, things like that. If you're seeing that, this, applies. Some people want to stick to revenue models they know because it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, but things change. They always change. It's okay. You can't be running a bookstore on the corner and just ignoring Amazon in 1999 as eventually it's going to be, it's going to be a struggle for you. Who used to go to Books A Million? All the, one and two blows closed. I think most of them are. Barnes & Noble still around. I don't even know how. I think they got some kind of deal with Amazon. I don't know. But there's things always change in the marketplace. And, um, and while I don't know that this is as big of a change, I think that it probably will, will go down. It is possible that a big change comes and it's gonna pave the way for that next layer of people that are like capitalizing on it, you know? So think that. Take this data, so I'm still talking about top-down approach. Take this data and create a conceptual solution in a business so you can pitch it to investors, use stories about current processes uh, versus how your innovative solution will change things, get investors, relatives, PE, business owners, et cetera. Use investment funds to hire talent to build the business backwards into profitability. That's top-down. That's top-down. I wanted to, to talk about that because all of you guys 99% of you are bottom up, bottom up, bootstraps. You went out, you started selling. You went out, you started recruiting agents. Bootstraps, who thinks they're bootstraps? They're bottom up. Who thinks they would be in the bottom up realm, okay? So let me tell you the problem with the bottom up side. Bottom up would seem like it wouldn't be foreign to most, but the problem is most of the people who have started that way have zero experience building a business. They have no experience building a business. Who got into the, uh, the insurance world, you know, and they had a job before that? They were going from a job into insurance, independent, okay? So you went self-employed, business owner, right out of the gate, right? But you worked at a job before. So it's not like you had no experience at all, but you haven't built a business, right? You are building the business right now. So the steps for bottom up are market to attract high quality prospects for your team. That's number one. If you are getting into insurance and you are thinking about corporate infrastructure from the get-go or, uh, or like SEO or blah, 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 all these like, you know, crazy, you know, philosophies or mission statements or getting an office and rebuilding things and blah, blah, blah. In the beginning, it's marketing to attract high quality prospects for your team is the only thing that matters. It's the only thing that matters. And your team in the beginning is guess what? You, that's it, okay? Now that when you get past this, we're delaying gratification, remember, for a while, delaying gratification. You delayed gratification, didn't you? Yeah, say it, you did. Delay gratification, so you can expand your team by hiring more agents and service personnel to address operational gaps. I'm going to, I say and, this is some people say, what do I hire first? It's the age old question. Admin or LOA agent? I disagree with most. I say LOA agent. Uh, you know, they can, double, they can double up in the beginning, right? But I need an LOA agent first, right? And I'll talk about LOA later. Expand your team by hiring more agents and service personnel to address operational gaps. Delay gratification. Continue the hiring and marketing process until revenue supports outsourcing or promoting of tasks like marketing, event, organization, and administration. Now, when Jacob made my slideshow, 
he condensed these steps because I had 30 steps here. And 15 of them were delay gratification. Because I want to remind you to keep delaying gratification so that you can take the next step. You can't take the next step if you're spending the money you're making right away. That's not what businesses do. That's what employees do. So if you're not an employee anymore and you're running a business and you want it to grow and you're wondering why it's not growing, it's because you're spending all the profit. Or it's because you haven't even got off the ground yet. Who's off the ground? Most of you are off the ground. Who's making $100,000 or more? You're off the ground, okay? So now it's quit spending it on anything but business. Do the old Dave Ramsey uh, Vienna sausages and refried beans or whatever, all right? Delay gratification. Scale marketing efforts and hire more agents to increase revenue. I've talked about this before, it's the seesaw. Marketing, operations. Marketing, operations. For the most part, it's marketing sales, marketing sales, marketing sales, marketing sales. I have more leads than I can help. I have more agents than I can feed. I have more leads than I can help. I have more agents than I can feed. That's not a bad thing. That's how business works. That's like the definition of business. They just don't, you know, they'll, somebody else defines business some goofy way. That's how a business owner defines business. I scale my marketing, get it higher, higher quality, higher quality, higher quantity, and then I can't help all those people, and I gotta hire people, and then I gotta train them. And then you say, well, I'm so busy helping all these people, I don't have time to train anybody. Okay, while you're helping them, they can watch. That's how I train the first agents I hired. I just said, okay, I'm gonna help people, and you sit there, you know? And if you can't learn like that, then my business ain't ready for you yet. I need somebody who can learn that way. That's the way it was. Promote or hire managers. So there's a certain point where I need to develop some sort of mid-level effect, where I have people taking on menial tasks, you know, outsourcing button clicking, outsourcing everything I can. And let me tell you this, hire them before you need them, you'll find things for them to do. My COO, I started as a graphic designer, first graphic designer I hired, now he's a COO. He does shit now that I didn't even know I needed somebody to do and that he didn't know how to do six months ago. That's just the way it is. Having someone who's good at learning and reliable, they're useful, very useful. Uh, and you can make them more and more useful. So hire someone before you need them. You'll figure it out. If you need them a little bit, if you think I can fill 15% of their time with tasks, go ahead and hire them. That's the way I feel about it, okay? Delay gratification, keep delaying. Now, at some point in here, our journeys may diverge. You may say, well, Justin, I don't want to build what you built. I don't, want to, I don't want to do that, so I don't want to delay gratification for that long. And that's okay, we'll talk about that. This was and is my journey coming up in this industry. I didn't have the steps. I didn't have the steps. Um, I just had a mindset. Everything is possible. Nowhere to go but up. I'm aggressive, even though I'm broke. It was, uh, in the beginning, I wanted to make 60,000, and everything was just got to do that. Then I started falling in love with the process, and then it was just, I got to overcome every little obstacle. And then my horizon shifted of, there's a lot of gratification in helping people. And that's another tip, by the way. The gratification you're finding, before you can do watches and cars and whatever it is that you like, vacations or whatever, Find the gratification in helping people. That's enough gratification and a good night's rest. Then get up and keep doing that for a while. Don't delay that gratification. I didn't have the steps. I just had that mindset. Now, I have the steps now. If I was rebuilding what I've built now, first of all, I'd do it slightly different, and we all would, and uh, I would do it in two years instead of 10 because I know what I know, but nobody was teaching it, right? The great news is we are giving you step-by-step -step actions to take to get where we are. This afternoon, I'm going to talk about the most profitable business model in the industry for all of you. And it happens to be mine. It is very profitable in a way where everybody's paid very well, the customers are happy, 
And it continues to scale and grow, and it's very profitable. And a very small amount of the profit comes from MedicareCon. As a matter of fact, I think this, last year we lost $150,000 on this event. This year, I think we'll make a couple hundred thousand, you know, once you take away all the time we spent on it. But Justin, I don't want to go where you are. That's what I was talking about. I don't want to go where you are. I just want to help, you know, 100 people a year. Yes, you do want to go where I am, okay? It's good. I flew out here private. I picked my son up from school in a Lambo the other day, and everybody was taking pictures. You might not want a Lamborghini, but let me tell you, it's pretty cool picking up a seventh grader in a Lamborghini, okay? It is. If you think it's not, that's a loser thought, okay? It is cool. It just is. The journey of where I am will get you where you want to go, okay? So if you're, if, you're, if you're aiming to get where we are right now, my, our reven, my revenue goal, my gross revenue goal this year is 20 million. Our, that journey to that, if you decide later, you know, in there, okay, this is enough, I want to try to do scale or I want to sell or I want to blah, 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 whatever, well, you can do that. But the journey to being a loser is definitely not going to get you where you want to go or make you happy. Okay, and there's a lot of gratification in building yourselves out of the menial task, creating a business. I think, I don't know who said this, but when you can find somebody that can do something 70% as good as you, you should stop doing it yourself. Does that make sense? Most of you are thinking, nobody can do it as good as me. Oh, micromanage, I'm the best. And you are the best. You're all the best because you believe you're the best. You're the best at that task. But do you want to be the best at that task? Or do you want to have the best business overall? Okay? When you can find somebody that can do something 70% as good as you, you should quit doing it. I initially did all of our own marketing, all of the tech stuff, everything. I was everything. Steven Martinez came in, and I was like, I got to do things, this, this shit, 170% as good as I can, so I'm going to quit doing these tasks. Okay? And then... Thankfully, he took a real interest in it. But that is important. The journey to where we are will get you there. So when I tell you that I'm going to paint this picture of how we got where we are this afternoon, I want you guys to think, okay, I take notes to get there. Don't think, I don't want to get there. That's stupid, okay? That's stupid. The business is growing in the right direction. If you want to get 20% there, you got to go towards 100% to get to 20%. So it's the same shit. As your reality expands, your planned departure for the journey likely will too. I told you I wanted to make $60,000 a year 10 years ago. Now I want to make 20 million gross in the business this year. It's fun. My employees are happy that my best friends work for me. Why would I want to do anything else? I, get to, I, flew, I flew on a Phenom 300 with my wife, my brother, my two kids to the Bahamas and Disney and did VIP days a few weeks ago. That was freaking awesome. Okay, it's awesome. And that's not bad because we helped 75,000 Medicare beneficiaries over the last few years and like thousands of agents help more. We, there's probably a cumulative millions of Medicare beneficiaries helped by this. So we're helping people. So if I get to disproportionately benefit from that, I don't think it's a bad thing. And if you think it's a bad thing, then you shouldn't be in this room full of capitalist entrepreneurs. Okay? You should go work for the government and pretend like you care about people <laughs> while patting your own pockets. Perfect. All right. If your cop-out is your age, just remember Adidas was started by a 49-year-old. McDonald's became what it is because of a 52-year-old. And Colonel Sanders franchised KFC when he was 62. And don't tell me about Adidas's history. I don't know. But you know, there's some rumors, whatever. Uh, it's from Germany in that era, whatever. You know, all I'm saying is they weren't, you know, spring chickens. If your cop out is, this looks hard. I just told you it's hard. It's also fun. Why are you here? I didn't did I come here to say, I don't want to do anything hard. I want to do easy stuff. Are you looking for purpose? Who's looking for purpose? Who, who has purpose? Raise your hand if you have purpose. Who's looking to scale their business? It's a purpose. I'm looking for a purpose to help more people, gratified. Who wants to help their family more? 
Who wants to be able to help their family with debts that they have that they might work until they die to pay off? Who wants to take their kids places that they didn't get to go and give them a life that they didn't get to give? You know what does that? Money. You know how you get money? Help a shitload of people. Okay? My purpose is to show you how to turn your goal of helping 100 people a year or 500 people or 1,000 people into 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. It's to think bigger and to know that you can do it without sacrificing the quality. In this talk, the main point I want to drive home is to be open. Be open while you're here to what we aim to accomplish. Be open. Don't be cynical. The lid of cynical intellectualism held me back for years. Don't think you have everything figured out. I learn things from people that have been in this business less than a year all the time. Somebody commented on one of Justin, who knows Justin Thomas? Facebook ad extraordinaire, Justin Thomas. Okay, he had an ad, it was, it was in my feed the other day, and somebody commented because he said in there, in my 10 years helping insurance agents, whatever, and some guy said, oh, 10 years, and he was like, clearly one of those guys that's been in the industry for 30 or 40 years, so I commented, facetiously under him, said, you're right, I can't believe he's bragging about 10 years. I want to find somebody who's been in it 40 years and is still a loser to learn from. <laughs> like, the amount of time that you've been doing something doesn't mean anything. The impact that you had in that time. Now, in 40 years, if you helped a shitload of people and you were very successful, that is commendable. But if you just existed for that period of time, you probably know a lot of stuff, but apparently you didn't do much with it, okay? The truth is, the lonely road to success sucks. Some people think, if you know how to do something so well, why aren't you doing it? Well, I am, but I've also built myself out of my business. I walk around my business sometimes like this, going around the halls, we have this brand new beautiful building. We're like six or seven buildings in at this point. I'm walking around, talking to people, just so happy. Hey, Megan. <laughs> hey, hey, Jackson, give me a hug. Hey, Sid. Hey, Sid. <laughs> and then I think, what do I have to do in this business anymore? I've hired all the people and they're doing such a good job. Started out 70% as good as me, now cumulatively it's 100% plus. Better than I could do it. Better, and they will. Do it better than you could do it. And the thing is, eventually I had to have more purpose for that. And now my purpose is helping you accomplish the same thing. Because I don't have to run my business anymore. It's running and growing, not just maintaining. Without me, I have very little input, but 5% of my time as a human being is dedicated to growing that portion of the business, the agency portion at this point. Now there's the brokerage side that continues to grow, which is fun. There's helping you guys, but I have that time. So the truth is, people will say, if you made this much money, why are you helping these people? Because people that make a lot of money, like I told you I wanted to make 60,000 and now the goal is 20 million. It's fun building businesses. It's fun. That's why we want to keep doing it. It's not about the, the money is a byproduct of the success, right? I'm already downsizing things. I have a lake house, love it. Don't spend enough time there selling it, okay? So now I'm on this part where I'm like, I bought all these things I thought I wanted and I don't really want them. I'll probably end up selling that Lamborghini. After it gets old, once I drive up to the middle school and the kids are like, there's that stupid Lamborghini again, then I'm gonna be like, I'm not cool anymore, I'm selling this thing. <laughs> it had its effect. I don't really give a shit about the Lamborghini. I don't even enjoy it unless my kids are sitting in the seat with me, you know, or sit, right? I don't enjoy it. Tempest doesn't wanna ride in it. She says it's uncomfortable, so my wife is not riding in the Lamborghini much. But the lonely road to success sucks, so I wanna bring you guys with me. I wanna see you win. I don't even give a shit if you compete with me. I don't care. Who cares? There's like 70 million beneficiaries. And this year, probably double what the normal changes will happen because of Part D and that component, which doesn't just affect standalone Part D, it affects Medicare Advantage. It's gonna be a lot of shakeup, right? So tons of work to do. And we can feel like we were part of the solution because the government ain't gonna solve shit. We are, we're the innovators. It's you that are doing it. The model I teach allows you to find the highest reward 
right in your backyard and simultaneously becomes the free market solution to the issues that face our niche. If everyone followed our blueprint, CMS would have nothing to complain about. But right now, they aren't completely unjustified. Some businesses suck and are causing a lot of issues. And there's a uh, So let's build the most profitable and impactful business we can. All of us serve thousands of enthusiastic, high intent prospects and clients annually and have happy employees doing it. The way we can be the loudest is by building better businesses. If everybody built our business in this industry instead of some of these other ones, CMS would be like, hey, pff, Medicare's going pretty good. Not a lot of complaints. Everything is awesome, you know? How many live transfers do I get from Middle East? Zero. So we're at MedicareCon, and we're gonna kick ass, and you're gonna go back and build better businesses, and we're gonna show people that the private market, the free market solution, what you're participating in is the solution, not more regulation. There's no need for additional regulation. It's done. We're the solution. Be the solution. Delay gratification. Build a great business. And then give your family what they really need free to buy your time back. That's what we're going to work on it right now.